السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والأوصياء والصديقين وعترة نبيك الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى يوم الدين عباد الله أوصيكم وأوصي نفسي بتقوى الله ولزوم أمره This is in continuation of last night's which is July 16th discussion on the opinion and the theories of the scholars on hellfire. How do they explain it? Today I'm going to specifically address the opinion of two prominent theologians, philosophers, Gnostics who speak about hellfire in general and also they explain or they justify how people might go there the disbelievers, the deniers but that would be okay for them they would accept it meaning they accept being burnt in the hellfire this is how they perceive it specifically two of the philosophers main philosophers Muhyiddin ibn Arabi and Sadrul Deen al-Shirazi Sadrul Muta'allihin or Mulla Sadra because they are mystics and Gnostics and Sufis they have problem with believing that God is going to burn his servants because mysticism my, my friends revolves around the concept of love and compassion and forgiveness and therefore they have hard time to believe that God who created his servants the creatures would one day punish them in a that severe way so the first one of them is Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi let me speak about his background Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi was born in Andalusia in a city called Morsha which is not too far from Alicante on the Mediterranean in southern Spain he was born in 558 Hijri and died in 638 Hijri he lived for almost 80 years which is about 800 years ago he is considered a Shaykh al-Akbar al-Arif al-Akbar by far he is considered by his followers and his students to be the most prominent Sufi or mystic figure in the history of Islam and therefore he has inspired thousands and thousands over these centuries thousands and thousands of philosophers scholars theologians Muslims and non-Muslims were inspired by his writings and his theories he's a Shaykh al-Akbar Ibn Arabi uh, lived in his birthplace in his town and then he moved to Granada to Sevilla in Andalusia in southern Spain and then he crossed the Mediterranean to North Africa he lived sometime in North Africa 
Algeria, Tunisia. Then he moved to Egypt, to Cairo. Then he moved to Iraq, to Mosul. Then after that to Hejaz, which is Mecca and Medina. Then he ended up in Syria, in Damascus, where he died. And he's buried, he has a grave in Jabal Qasyun. Jabal Qasyun is a very famous mountain that overlooks the city of Damascus. So he's buried there. It's very funny that this man, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, is considered by his fans as being a saint, Qaddis, Wali, one of the greatest friends of God or servants of God, the greatest ever. Whereas his opponents, they consider him to be evil, to be non-Muslim, to be a, an apostate, a heretic, because of his theory, philosophical theory. I will come to it soon. This man at the age of 36 went to Mecca. While he was in Mecca, he met a Persian scholar, a prominent scholar from Bilad Faris, from Persia. And he met his daughter, her name is Nivam, and he fell in love with her because we, we've been told that this daughter, this uh, lady, Nidham, the Persian lady, was very attractive, physically was very beautiful and attractive, and also she possessed the inner beauty, husnul akhlaq. So God had endowed her with the inner beauty and the outer beauty. So he fell in love with her, and she shaped his opinions and his theories. He was inspired by her. He was in a true love with this lady. And it is amazing how sometimes women or wives inspire their husbands. They become a source of empowerment for their husbands. And sometimes, of course, a source of weakness or devastation. Same thing with, with, with husbands. Sometimes a husband, a man, can be a source of empowerment, a source of uh, success, progress for his wife. And sometimes, unfortunately, he, he can be a source of, you know, devastation and suffering for his wife and for his family. So this man, he says, he was inspired by his wife and his wife was backing him, behind him. And one of the secrets of his success was this Persian lady, Nivan. And he wrote a book. He wrote many books, of course. But the most important and the most prominent among them is Al Futuhatul Makkiyah, which today could be could be found in four volumes, it could be found in nine volumes, and it could be found according to the publishers. It could be found in fifty volumes. In that book he speaks about Wahdatul Wujud, his theory, his maxim of Wahdatul Wujud, which earned him the respect and admiration of some, and on, on the other hand, earned him the wrath and the disgust of others. What is it, Wahdatul Wujud? Wahdatul Wujud means simply means the unity of the existence he and other philosophers with him like Sadruddin al-Shirazi which I'm going to speak about him later on and many other philosophers believe that in this universe there is only one existence al-wujud wahid wal-mawjud muta'addid but the existence are many. The existence is one, but the existence are many. There is only one existence. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ Nothing in this universe except God. We are the manifestations, the pictures of that only existence 
in this universe. We are the shadow. He says in his book, in his book he says, in al-'arifa, who is the arif? Arif is the one who possesses the knowledge, the esoteric knowledge, the hidden knowledge, the secret knowledge of spiritual matters. This person is called arif. This is a, a Sufi expression. And Arif is the highest level, the highest degrade and the highest level in, in, in Irfan, in Gnosticism and mysticism is Al-Arif. And he's considered Al-Arif Al-Akbar. So he says the Arif, the real Arif, is the one man yara al fi kulli shay, who can see God in every item. You turn left and right, you see God in front of you. Bal yarahu. He further goes. He further goes and says, "Bal yarahu, aynu kulli shay. Whatever you see, that is God. So for him, God and nature, God and universe are one. They are not divided. He believes that there is no creator and created or creatures. They are one. They are one. There is only creator." The creature is a shadow. And they use verses from the Quran. For instance, in Surah An Nur, chapter 24 in the Quran Allahu Nurus Samawati Wal Earth. Verse number 35 Allahu Nurus Samawati Wal Earth. Mathalu Nurihi Kemisbahin. مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء God guides to his light whomsoever he likes it's by invitation only يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالِ لِلنَّاسِ God extends parables for mankind to understand him to get what he's saying وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالِ لِلنَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ I don't want to speak about this verse now but this is my favorite because after he's speaking about himself that he is the only existence Allahu nuru samawati wal earth means that he is the only existence in this universe he is the only light of the heaven and the earth other things are nothing but darkness he is the nur but then god says i bestow from my light on certain people who are they Look at the one after it, 36. فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُ A reference to Ahlul Bayt. Abu Bakr stood and said, Ya Rasulullah, هَذَا الْبَيْتُ مِنْهَا pointed to the house of Ali and Fatima inside the compound of the Prophet, inside the mosque of the Prophet. أَهَذَا الْبَيْتُ مِنْهَا Is this house one of these buyut that God speaks about in this chapter? The Prophet said, Hada min afadiliha. This house is number one. Small house. Maybe the size of that house does not exceed 300 square feet. Maybe. Maybe even less. But that is mansion number one on earth. Palace number one on earth. Fi buyutin adin Allahu an turfa' wa yuthkara fi hasmu. So, those Gnostics say that in this universe there is nothing but God. And then they say in Surah Al-Furqan, which is chapter 25, verse, I believe, 45. Yes. Okay. Verse 45 in chapter 
in chapter 25, Surah Al-Furqan. أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَيْفَ مَدَّ الظِّلْ وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَجْعَلَهُ سَاكِنًا Haven't you considered how your Lord spreads out the shadow, casts out the shadow, extends the shadow? We are shadow. We are not a reality. We are shadow of God's image. This is what he thinks. Now, I'm not, I'm not here supporting this theory because this theory is extremely, extremely controversial. Extremely controversial. So I'm not advocating this theory, but I'm trying to explain his view with full honesty to you, my friends. Trying to tell you why Ibn Arabi, some people did not like him and they considered him to be zindiq, a heretic, because of his theory of wahdatul wujud, the unity of the existence. But he says, according to the Quran, that this shadow is us is every creature in this universe, every created by God, every creature, is a shadow cast from the unseen. So we are nothing. In this universe, there is no reality other than God. The only true existence is God. Is God. Of course, his opponents, they say this world is considered of several types, several types of existence, not only one, wajibul wujud, which is God, mumkinul wujud, which is us, the possible existence. He is the essential existence. We are the possible existence. And mumtani'ul wujud, a forbidden, impossible existence, that is another type. So they argue with him, of course. But this is his idea. He says, Everything in this universe is going to perish. Quran says in Surah Al-Qasas, verse 88, chapter 28, verse 88, Kullu illa wajhah. Every, all things perish except the face of God. In Surah Al-Rahman, chapter 55, verse 26, Kullu man alayha fan. All things that are upon earth are going to be annihilated, are, are going to pass away. And there remains only the face of your Lord, possessed of majesty and beauty. So we are nothing. We're going to perish. This is what he thinks. Now, this man in his book, Futuhatul Makkiyah, he says something very important, which I respect him for this opinion. He says, the jewel of God's creation and the masterpiece of God's creation in this universe is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet Muhammad was ilahi. He's the medium of God's blessings, God's guidance, God's grace to mankind, to all mankind, not just to the Muslims. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ To entire mankind. But then he says something, this is my favorite line. He says, Number one after the Prophet and the closest one to the Prophet spiritually, spiritually speaking, is Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this man is enchanted with Imam Ali. He's in love with Imam Ali. Ibn Arabi, when he comes to hellfire, what does he say in his book, Futuhatul Makkiyah? He says, Ashaddul Adab. The worst suffering in this life, mufaraqatul watan. When you miss, when you are separated from your home, that is the worst type of suffering. فَلَوْ فَارَقَ النَّارَ أَهْلُهَا لَتَعَذَّبُوا بِاخْتِرَابِهِمْ And thus, 
when the people of the fire, and he takes this term people of the fire from the Quran, أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ God says, أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ لَا يَسْتَوِي أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ وَأَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ The people of paradise are not equal to the people of the hellfire. لَا يَسْتَوِي They are not equal. So he says, the people of hellfire, if they leave it, if they exit from it, they're going to suffer. Look at how he sees perpetuity and eternity a life without parole and the maximum sentence in hellfire this is how he perceives it because he cannot imagine that God is the one who punishes he says they are not being punished because hellfire for them represent home original home therefore they are enjoying Everyone loves his home, home sweet home. We love our homes. When I travel and go into many countries and I stay in good hotels, but I miss my home, I miss my room. Home sweet home. So he says, because they are used to this home, so if they get out of hellfire, they're going to suffer. But when they are in the hellfire, they don't suffer. Waqad. Furthermore, he says, وَقَدْ خَلَقَهُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ حَيْئَةٍ تَأْلَفُ ذَلِكَ الْمَوْطِنِ God has formed them in a way, he manufactured them in a way which is compatible to that home so they can endure hellfire. What do you think of this opinion? They stay in hellfire and they endure it. Imam Ali says something else. Imam Ali says, Fahabni, suppose, in Dua Kumail, Fahabni ya ilahi wa sayyidi wa mawlaya wa rabbi, sabartu ala adabik, fakayfa asbar. Suppose I can endure the chastisement, but how can I endure separation from you? Suppose I can bear, endure the flames, the heat of the hellfire. But how can I endure? Not being able to look, to gaze, to watch the beauty, the majesty of my Lord. He says, maybe hellfire it's easy for me, but there is a bigger punishment being separated from my Lord. That is the main, that is the cardinal punishment on the Day of Judgment. But then Imam Ali does not deny or negate the fact that there is hellfire and there is punishment and there is suffering too. He says in Dua Kumail, أَقْسَمْتَ أَنْ تَمْلَأَهَا مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ You fill it with deniers, concealers of faith. Kafir means, the literal meaning of kafir means a concealer of faith, a concealer of the truth. أَقْسَنْتَ أَنْ تَمْلَأَهَا مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ From both jinn and men and people. وَأَنْ تُخَلِّدَ فِيهَا الْمُعَانِدِينَ And you perpetuate, eternalize مُعَانِدِين Those who defied you, those who were arrogant, those who turned against you and against mankind. Now, Sadr al Muta'allihin. Who is Sadr al Muta'allihin? Sadr al Muta'allihin is Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al Shirazi. He was born in Shiraz in 950 uh, Hijri, or 980 Hijri, in fact, and he died in 1050 Hijri. So he lived for almost 70 years. He lived 
in Shiraz. He died in Basra, Basra, southern Iraq, on his way to Hajj, performing Hajj. But then he lived in Shiraz and he lived in Isfahan during the Safawides dynasty. Isfahan was the capital, the capital of Persia at that time. And he's the one who synthesized between falsafa and irfan, philosophy and Gnosticism. He blended them together. He fused them together. And his school is known as Madrasatul Hikmatil Muta'aliyah. He died 400 years ago. Ibn Arabi died 800 years ago. Mullah Sadra was inspired by the work of Ibn Arabi and his theories in philosophy. And he wrote many books, numerous work he did. But the most important one is as Al Asfarul Aqliyatul Arba. Kitab al Asfar, well known for the Asfar. Because he believes that we are journeying in this life. Ya ayyuhal insan, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. You are journeying. We are in a journey. We are not stagnant. We are not staying somewhere. We are, our souls are journeying always. And he studied under Sheikh uh, Al Baha'i, Baha'uddin Al Amili, and one of his most prominent students is Al Faydul Kashani, Al Mawla Al Faydul. I need enough time to speak about those great scholars, philosophers of Islam. Sadruddin al Shirazi, or Mullah Sadra, when he comes to his mentor, of course, there's 400 years between them. Ibn Arabi, he says Ibn Arabi is wrong because the home, hellfire cannot be a natural home. Yes, he's a true when he says the biggest suffering is when you leave your home. He's a true in that. But hellfire cannot be a natural abode, a natural home. It cannot be a natural home. Hellfire is an exception. So he does not agree with Ibn Arabi in his theory. But he has another explanation of how this suffering is being reduced and they don't feel it. He himself, Sadruddin, follow me on this. It's very sharp point. He says in his book, Hikmatul Muta'aliyah, he comes to the verse in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf. A'raf is Surah Al-A'raf, the heights is chapter number seven, verse number 179 Surah Al-A'raf also one of the most powerful statements in the Quran Indeed we have created for hellfire kathiran many min al-jinn wal ins of jinn and man lahum qulubun they possess hearts la yafqahuna biha with which they don't understand. Walahum a'yunun, they possess eyes with which la yubsiruna biha. Walahum adhanun, they possess ears with which la yasma'una biha, they don't hear with it. Ula'ik, those people are like cattle, kal an'am. Belhum adal, even worse. Ula'ika humul ghafilun, indeed. Those people are the heedless, the stubborn, the arrogant, the prideful, those who don't listen. They don't want to listen. They do have hearts. They do have heart here means brains, but they don't understand with it. You spend hours and hours and hours trying to explain to them with logic, with rationality. Still, they reject because of ta'assub because of desire, because of bigotry, because of racism, because of these mental and spiritual and emotional diseases that they have. They can't break away from these diseases. They can't let go. 
So those are, God says, worse than animals. So God we cre says we created hellfire for them. Now, li jahannam wa laqad dhara'na li. Li, li jahannam, lam, means four. And this four, this lam has two meanings. Either lam al or lam al ghaya. Lam al means as a result of their deed, misdeed, they're going to be sent to hellfire. Lamul Ghaya means God created them from the first day for the hellfire. So he says in his book, Hikmah al Muta'aliyah, he says he wants to justify that people of hellfire are okay to stay there. It's not a punishment for them. This is what he says. He says, إن المخلوق الذي غاية وجوده أن يدخل في جهنم a creature that the ultimate goal of his creation is to go to hellfire لا بد أن يكون ذلك الدخول موافقا لطبعه therefore this entrance into hellfire is compatible and consistent with his nature because he has been created and made ready for that custom made he says, God custom makes some people for, for hellfire. So lamb for him, lamb in li jahannam is lil ghaya. God prepared them from day one. Li tab'ihi, muafiqan li tab'ihi, wa kamalan li wujudihi. In fact, being in hellfire for such creatures, such terrible creatures, is a perfection, is kamal for them. وَكَمَالُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يَكُونُ عَذَابًا لَهُ When something is enjoying his perfection, then that type of perfection is not considered a torture, عذاب. وَإِنَّمَا يَكُونُ عَذَابًا لِغَيْرِهِ Hellfire is going to be a torture for those who are not made for the hellfire. I don't accept what Sadr al-Din. Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi is the greatest philosopher greatest Hakim, greatest Gnostic, but I disagree with his assumption that God created from day one. God never creates from day one. Even God did not create Iblis from day one to send him to hellfire. Iblis had a free choice. It was his own choice. Where is this? It's in the Quran. God says in the Quran, Inna hadaynahu sabila imma shakiran wa imma kafura. We show them the way. Either they become grateful or ungrateful. They choose through their free will, they choose either path. Or in Surah Al Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 105. قَالُوا رَبَّنَا غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْنَا شِقْوَتُنَا وَكُنَّا قَوْمًا ضَالِّينَ The people of hellfire are going to say, we are here because of us, not because you wanted to cast us into the hellfire. غَلَبَتْ عَلَيْنَا شِقْوَتُنَا Our wretchedness and evil overwhelmed us and brought us into this place. وَكُنَّا قَوْمًا ضَالِّينَ We were... We were a people of astray, astray. It's our own wrongdoings. God does not send someone from day one. God does not book someone who has not still born or he's in his, his mother's tummy or womb. He books him a seat in hellfire. He doesn't do that. God is the Lord of compassion and mercy. Next time. I'm going to continue on this because I have not finished. And I'm going to explain the opinion of some people who believe in the embodiment of a human deeds in the hereafter. Meaning that those who go to hellfire or stay there forever, their deeds that they made here is sending them there. It is their decision. They brought that upon themselves. We're going to continue on this philosophical subject. May Allah bless you all. May Allah protect you on this beautiful day, Friday. May Allah accept your deeds, your prayers. 
We have to stay at home, as I said last night. We have to wear the mask. And in Ahsantum, Ahsantum li Anfusikum. If you do good, if you follow the instructions, you can shorten this period. You can put an end to this pandemic. But if we don't listen, we're going to suffer longer and longer. This is what we saw in America and in other countries. So let's take care of our health and the health of those who are around us and our country and our society and the whole world through the right choice, making the right choice. اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Please join me in reciting سورة الفاتحة for so many uh, friends who passed away in America in Europe and in the Middle East because of this virus. Al-Fatiha ma'a salati ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim imalik yawm ad-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina al-Sarat al-Mustaqeem. Al-Sarat al-Ladhina an'amta alayhim. Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim. Munadda al-Lin. Sadaqallahu al-Ali al-Azim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.